Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Hey everybody, hopefully you guys are doing well. I'm doing pretty good over here. Um, it was a crazy week for me last week. Super busy at work, super stressful too. Um, even through the weekend, the calls just kept coming. And it's not, it wasn't like, and, and this is just the, the intro to summer for us, right? But it was just a weird series of circumstances. I had a guy that was out sick and, you know, we had our first like, uh, our longest heat wave so far of the season. We've had a few like one days where it gets hot, but it was a consistent, you know, probably 10 days of upper 90s. So it wasn't even the the, the big part of our summer. But because, um, you know, like our, our max temperatures during the summer is like 115 to 120, like right in that range. So um, but yeah, it was just hot. We were busy. Lots of service calls. We're still kind of started this week a little bit better everybody's back to work and uh you know we're kind of uh trying to get a handle on all the craziness that happened last week you know when we have these big heat waves we kind of go into triage mode where um you know we just literally run around putting fires out when we get so busy so it's just like boom you know reset the pressure control rinse the condenser we'll come back to follow up you know uh you know and just kind of moving along and then we'll go back the next week and be like all right I need to go through this system, you know, and, and start addressing some concerns that I had on the, the service call day. And that's kind of how we do it. Uh, you hope, though, like right now, I kind of like this time because we get a big heat wave and then it's mild this week, you know, and then it's like, boom, then it's going to pick back up. So it gives us a little bit of time to kind of get into the groove. So that's at least how we handle it. You know, though, uh, you know, you you Midwest guys, you northern guys, you guys get to do that in the heating season and in the cooling season see for out out here in the west um or southwest whatever you want to call us it's uh you know we don't have a cooling i mean a heating season very much so this is our our money making time you know so um but it's been a great week other than that you know uh started out today really cool and um got home a little early was able to get ready for the stream which it's funny because i've been so busy i've been missing streams and it's like i went to my scheduling software to to make the stream today and it was like 
you know, I hadn't streamed in a couple weeks and it's like, oh, wow, you know, it's just, just been nuts, you know, it's how it goes. So, um, had a really cool question. Hello to everybody in the chat. Uh, remember guys, um, if you guys have questions that you want me to cover, uh, put them in caps lock in the chat and I'll try to get to them. If I forget to get to your question or I don't have time, shoot me an email, hvcrvideos at gmail.com. Okay. So Curtis, um, had asked me a question and I'm just going to kind of read his, uh, his email to you guys. And then I'm going to address a few things in it. And it's, it's a great email. So, um, He's saying that he understands that we do PM service as service technicians, but he's questioning me now. As I was coming up in the field, was I led by a more experienced, often guiding and helping on the jobs? Um, and did I get a lot of service calls? Did I get a lot of hands-on experience? Um, outside of preventative maintenance, uh, did I get to work on different types of equipment? So he's just kind of asking about my, my intro into the trade. Um, and then he asks, how did I get so sharp? Sharp is a relative term. Um, I, I don't see myself as anything special. I just see myself as a person that has made a lot of mistakes and doesn't want to re repeat those mistakes. Um, it's just how I see it. Um, but anyways, I, I, thank you for the sentiment. I really do appreciate it. But so I started working for my father in the trade and, um, from a young age, you know, until about a year out of high school, uh, that's when I came to work for him full time. I cut the you know, details out on that, but came to work for him full time. And from that point forward, I can say within working for my dad, uh, three years after I came to work with him full time, he stopped working. He put the tools up. Um, and then it was kind of it wasn't that I was ready to start running things. Uh, and that, by the way, was in 2002 was so by three years later. He was like, he was checking out. Uh, we did have someone else working for us, but basically it kind of started to fall on me. And then I started taking on more and more. So, yes, I mean, I, I was I observed my dad for many years as a kid previous to coming to work from full time. I was mentored by him then. So when I did start, I had a pretty good foundation of which, you know, my dad had required that I go to trade school too. So I went to trade school at the same time at nighttime, went to work during the day, and I slowly started taking more and more of the business. Uh, did I get, you know, hands-on walking me through everything? No, I was the person that had to figure it out with what I had. I didn't have uh, a, very much my dad there to come and walk me through things. It was, you know, I had basic guidance and it was just, I was just kind of thrown to the wolves. Okay. Um, which is ironic because I don't really like to throw people to the wolves and it's not saying that it didn't work for me. It did. I did fine with it, but I realized that there's a lot of technicians that can't handle that anymore, you know? So I don't want to do that to someone because even though I made it, I felt like I'm a small percentage of people that actually make it and don't get burnt out and quit the industry. Um, not saying I'm anything special. I just think it was just an abnormality that I didn't quit. Um, I did not have someone to guide me and show me all these different things. It's just how it was. And it wasn't anything intentionally meant, you know, by my dad or anything like that. It, it just, just the way that it works, you know, now I also came up in a time even before the 2000s, you know, people knew me. And so I had relationships with a lot of my customers. I was able to get away with things with not being able to fix it the first time. So it was a difficult transition for me. And I kind of had to claw my way out. Um, my apprenticeship process that I do right now, uh, this is the second time that I've done this, I think. Second. Yeah, this is the second time that I've done this where I'm training an apprentice for an entire year. Now, I'm just starting to release my apprentice. I don't even think I should call him my apprentice anymore because he's a service technician, right? If we give him levels from service technicians, he's a beginner, but he's a service technician. Now, he's out, you know, majority of the time. Um, that About a month ago, I started releasing him, and uh, I'd say that I may occasionally run into him here or there, um, you know, twice a week or something like that. But for the most part, he's by himself. I've given him tools and then he still has me. And then, you know, I kind of help him through things. So I'm trying to do things a little bit differently, but Curtis, no, I did not have someone walking me through every single step. Okay. And then I want to talk a little bit about the preventative maintenance side that you were kind of asking questions, Curtis. So, um, I, I, I observe you, I know who you are, Curtis. And, 
um, I see that you're getting a lot of great experience. Um, maintenances for me, they were boring. They were tedious. They were long, but I was also benefiting from maintenances. Okay. And maintenances, um, they preventative maintenance as it, at, that is, um, they help to train us as technicians because, you know, you go to the same place multiple times, right? It, if you're lucky enough to have contracts like I do, you go to the same place as many times, right? Over and over and over. And you start to pick up on things. So I started picking up doing those mundane, boring maintenances, you know, noises that didn't sound normal, vibrations that weren't there the last time. And you start, it's like muscle memory kind of happening, right? Now that still doesn't give you um, the ability to say or to, to know exactly what's going on, but those maintenances help to build you up as a technician and help to train you. Um, so, uh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going in the wrong direction with the way that you were asking this question, but I do have to say to everybody so much preventative maintenances when they, when they feel like they're boring, they're, they're long, you know, they just want to throw their headphones on. No, you don't, don't preventative maintenances can be the best place to protect the customer and build relationships with the customer because you can start bringing things up to them and it, and it actually helps, but then you get used to the locations. Okay. So PMs are really, really important. Um, but uh, hopefully I answered your question kind of there, Curtis. I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent, but all right, let's see. Um, let's see. Matthew Lopez in the chat says, how does my pay scale work for my shop? New starting wages. Well, everything's changing. Um, so honestly, our wages um, are changing all around and we really don't have a set thing. But in the past, um, we're not at this anymore because of inflation and all that stuff. But in the past, you know, we would be uh, starting a technician fresh out of trade school at about $18 an hour. Um, and then as a uh, that would be your starting wage. Right. And then as your experience goes on and you become a full journeyman technician, you can make an excess of uh, $35, $36 an hour or higher. The sky's the limit. Then you start taking on supervisory roles and different things like that. Um, but, I mean, that's our general pay scale. Uh, let's see what else. Um, you rarely work with uh, – I'm just reading through the chat, seeing what I'm missing. Have I ever been shocked? You farm and work with 480-volt irrigation sprinklers, and your boss had been shocked by 483 or four times now. Um, yeah, Kyler Crane, I have been shocked, but not by 480. Um, never that high. Uh, the highest I've ever been shocked by was a single leg of 120 volts, um, and that was just you know grounding myself out on it. Um, nothing more than that. Uh, you got to be careful with that stuff because 480 is not something you want to play with. I thank you uh, so much for being a continued supporter, man. It's awesome. Um, let's see what else we got going on in here. Uh, yes, this is a happy, dysfunctional family here. That's right. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Jason Johnson, actually, bro, um, you were the first person to answer my uh, movie trivia question uh the the or i'm sorry tv series i made a joke uh in one of my videos and said the first person to answer the question cor or the name of the sitcom correctly i'd send him a sticker so jason i know you're in the process of moving around and stuff so um let me know when you settle and give me your address and i'll get you all the stuff um let's see what else i'll get you the sticker uh let's see what else we got going on in here uh my buddy ralph is in here what is up ralph works for honeywell refrigerants um, lots of great people in here. Cool. All right. So um, let me cross Curtis's question off my list. So that way I already know I covered that one. Um, Kenny had sent me an email or t uh, question. I can't remember if it was a question or an email, but um, he was kind of curious as when he's charging a system, he was charging a particular system. And as he was charging it, he was just monitoring the system operations. And he noticed that uh, he had his, his amp clamp around the compressor as he was charging refrigerant in the system. And he noticed that every time he would add refrigerant, his current draw on the compressor would go up. And so he was kind of curious about that. Um, so Kenny, uh, understand, um, I may not have the best way of explaining this. I may not be the perfect person at explaining this, but I mean, it's, it's, I can give you some basic general ideas. Okay. And as a compressor is moving refrigerant, it moves refrigerant at a pretty consistent 
uh, rate, okay? So it's, it's pretty darn consistent. When you're adding refrigerant to the system, you are changing that consistency, okay? Then also the compressor is having to uh, work harder to move that refrigerant as you change the density by adding other refrigerant in there. So when you're doing that, um, you are going to make the compressor work more. So it is normal as charging a system for a compressor to slightly go up in current, okay? Um, things that you want to pay attention to, obviously, lean on the compressor manufacturers. They have some of the best information on how to work on their compressors. But, you know, um, just like you're doing, amp clamp on the system, listening to the sounds, feeling things, using your senses, and as you're charging, just go slow, okay? Always make sure that when you are charging with the system too, typically you don't want to see it going over the RLA of the compressor for very long, okay? On startups and things like that, there's different ways that we can control that, um, CPR valves, some other components, but basically that can reduce the amount of refrigerant coming back to the compressor and do it in a more controlled in, uh, way so that way it brings the current draw down. But with that being said, that's something you have to add to the system. But so it is normal for current draw to go up as you are adding refrigerant in increments. All right, so let's cross that one off. Hopefully I answered your question uh, properly for you, Kenny. Um, I do want to say uh, many thanks to several of you that have reached out to me. I've gotten tons and tons of emails uh, because I mentioned I was curious about a new flag crimping tool. Um, the consensus is that there's several different crimpers that have different types of dyes that go in them, and those seem to be the most popular and the best. They're ratcheting crimpers, so I will be looking into one. I haven't settled on a particular brand yet, but I do appreciate when I ask questions in the videos, those of you that reach out, whether comments, emails, or whatever, to, to send me information. It's very, very great, uh, awesome to have a, a community like all of you. And you know, I have a lot of lofty goals and ideas and different things, but um, uh, they're in my deep thoughts file. You know, I mean, I just have a little file of things that I write down and uh, um, the uh, I would like to make this channel a little bit more of a community somehow. So that is something that I'm thinking about. I get weird ideas like this sometimes, but I think it is awesome because the support that we get from in the people in the comments is amazing and they help each other in the YouTube comments, which is really, really cool. So thank you everybody for being that. Okay. Um, and thank you for answering the questions and helping me out. Let's see what else we got going on in here. One of the things that I brought up in a recent video was, uh, the one where there was sand blowing everywhere and we had a bunch of uh, contactors that were bad. I mentioned that I'd love to find a solution to eliminate these problems in these dusty conditions. And while I did get some feedback and, and different things, realistically, what I'm finding isn't really what I'm looking for at the moment. Like I understand, and I know I even made a comment in the video, but I understand there's contactors that we can get that are totally sealed. You can get vacuum contactors and different things like that. But I mean, we're talking three to five hundred dollars my cost for a contactor and while in the grand scheme of things that's probably still a good idea i'm still kind of looking for a little bit of an easier solution um but that may be the way that we go the other thing that i a lot of people brought up was maybe put it in like a um a pvc box electrical box put all the contactors in there or something like that um i have too much fear in a pvc box with the insulation value and everything it's going to get way too hot in a box to put a contactor without any kind of ventilation moving through it. So uh, I wouldn't put it in a totally enclosed box. Um, I, the ideas that people had of putting like weather stripping behind the electrical cover. Yeah, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, the elect electrical covers beat to crap and it's all bent. So that is something that we can do some kind of, I really didn't want to tape the boxes from the outside though, because it just sucks having to cut it all out and it just looks like crap. But you know, lots of great ideas. So thank you, everybody. I'm still trying to figure all that stuff out. Um, I am waiting, though, for Emerson uh, to start making their um, sure switches in three phase. Uh, recently just put a sure switch on my house uh, as I was just doing some PM work on my unit and clean the condensers and stuff. And then threw a sure switch on there that I'd honestly had in my garage for at least a year just sitting there. Uh, finally threw it on. 
It was a little complicated because my system had like this weird little circuit board that wasn't being used. It had a core sense controller and you know, anyways, I took all that stuff out, just put the, the sure switch in with just the standard pressure controls. And, uh, once I did that, it was a little weird having to unwire everything, but once I did, it was just easier just to boom, make it work the way I wanted to. So far the sure switch is doing great. So sure. The sure switch is a totally enclosed contactor. That's basically meant to handle the current of a compressor. Um, I've, I've looked and heard about different things about totally enclosed relays, uh, but I haven't had very good, uh, feedback about, um, totally enclosed relays that can handle the current and the inrush and the, the kind of environment that we get from starting refrigeration equipment. So I don't know if I'm wrong about that, but uh, so far I haven't found anything really good. Um, let's see what else we got going on in the chat. Um, right on uh a grubby i uh, really appreciate the support man um looking through the chat seeing what i'm missing in here uh let's see um yep okay cool we're good there uh would i ever add dye to a system to find micro leaks if so what brand thank you in advance uh matthew so um i have used dye Okay, but I don't like it. Uh, I have used, um, you know, acid scavengers and other additives, AC renew, and I've used all kinds of different things. Um, and uh, I don't like doing it. It just doesn't feel right. Okay, let's get down to the bottom line. Copeland compressors. Okay. Other than dye, I don't think Copeland approves any additives for their compressors and i think the dye i can't remember even if they approve dye but it's a really interesting story okay um when you listen to a copeland uh service person or educator talk like don gillis or formerly trevor matthews um the educator formerly known as oh wait no no never mind the educator that formerly worked for amerson anyways i was trying to make a joke but didn't work there um but uh reach out to those guys and ask them too. But when you hear the stories of what it takes to get approved by Copeland compressors, uh, to be in their systems, whether it be oils and all these different things, Copeland basically does extensive research into the tunes of tens of thousands, sometimes more dollars. Uh, actually I know it's more than tens of thousands. I think it might even be close to the hundreds of thousands in, um, research they do an analysis before they can approve things so therefore if you want to be approved by copeland this is what i've heard correct me if i'm wrong if you want to be approved by copeland you basically have to pay a crap ton of money to make sure that they can do all the testing they need to do before they'll give you approval and there's not many additives of any that are approved by copeland compressors it's very slim because a lot of people aren't willing to invest that kind of money on some of the things that they sell uh, the next thing, you know, again, I've used almost all the additives in different circumstances, not usually by choice, but by customers' demands or different things like that. Uh, the one thing that drives me nuts about dye is just it gets everywhere and it never goes away. Even after you change out a compressor, put in a different compressor, you think, oh, maybe it's going to dilute in the oil. No, the oil's still green. It's like, good gosh, that stuff is just horrid. I just can't see that stuff being good in a system, but I'm not a chemist, so I don't know about that. I just, I like to, I've, I've changed my ways and I really like to stay with what the compressor manufacturers want in the system. So I don't use flushes, don't use anything. I just will purge the system with nitrogen, evacuate it, new oil, and that's all that I'm going to put in a system. Um, Let's see. Uh, Bo had asked me a question. Um, his hood system at his restaurant has gone down. And when he called someone to take a look at it, the, the contractor insisted that he needs a new motor. I'm reading his email. So he went ahead and replaced the motor. 20 minutes into running, the motor goes off. Uh, and uh, the motor was just really, really hot is what he's saying. Uh, the contractor's insisting that maybe they need a smaller motor now. OK, so and then the contractor never came back. So what it sounds like, Bo, is that your contractor doesn't really know what's going on and how to work on exhaust fan systems. OK, a lot of people think that an exhaust fan is it's not a big deal. It's super easy, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into them and they're not as easy as they look to work on. It's not just, hey, motor change, boom, go on. 
There's a lot of factors that go into it. So you need to find a contractor in your area that knows what they're doing, okay? The next thing is, is that he even called the electrician out and the electrician checked to see if there was any shorts in the wires, said there's nothing. Um, and then he says that, you know, cause now the breaker's tripping for the exhaust fan. And then, so the electrician said, maybe he should just keep resetting the breaker. Um, yeah, I think you need to find a new electrician too. Okay. Um, no offense. Don't know, but I don't think they, from what you're telling me, it doesn't sound like your contractor or your electrician knows what they're doing. Okay. If a breaker trips, I will give my customers permission one time to reset the breaker. If that breaker trips again, I tell them, do not touch it ever again until you get an electrician or a contractor out there. That's the way that I fly with circuit breakers. Um, and that's just in a restaurant situation. Now you get into different areas, hospitals, different things like that. You're never allowed to reset a breaker until you go through full massive procedures. And there's nothing wrong with those massive procedures, but it's to protect human lives. So, um, yeah, I think you need to find a new contractor. Okay. If your motor is getting too hot, uh, and basically it sounds like there's a uh, plugged up duct work, hood filters are plugged up, um, or the motor is just massively undersized. Okay. Because your motor should not be getting that hot. Uh, it could not, you know, maybe they're not using the right type of motor. It's hard to say. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, get to the chat real quick and see what I'm missing in there. Uh, let's see. Will a cold liquid line ever be a symptom of a low charge? Hmm. Let me think about that. A cold liquid line. You know, my gut is telling me no. My gut is telling me no. I, I, my gut is telling me without thinking about this too hard that a cold liquid line would indicate some sort of a flashing off of gas in it. Uh, like a restriction causing that or something like that. That would be the only reason I would think that a liquid line would be cold. Uh, cold being a relative term, right? So obviously cold to your hand is going to be anything below, what, 98 degrees or something like that. And it's going to start to feel cooler and cooler. Um, but I, I don't think that a liquid line would ever be frosty um, or a cold liquid line. I, I don't know, though. That's an interesting question. I could be wrong. Um, let's see. Oh, there you go. Jason Johnson said, and tell your facilities guys to stop resetting units or alarms. It's a pain to show up with no alarms and the equipment is running. So Jason, I don't know if you're talking about something that I said, or if you're, I'm assuming you are, cause you put it in caps lock. Um, but, uh, yeah, working in facilities, um, there's, there's, there's a flip side to having facility service engineers, right? Because as an outside contractor, you'll go into a hospital or school or something like that. I've been that person and they have their own on-site facilities guys. And those guys, whether they're just curious or they're trying to prove that they're worth what they're getting paid, they like to push things. They like to reset things and not remember why or what was going on when they did it. Um, and then it makes it very difficult for the service contractor who by now the customer's fed up because their facilities, people haven't been able to fix it. So now they call us in and, you know, and then there's pressure on us and it's like, well, then you got to try to undo what these other guys did. Uh, this isn't resetting an alarm, but I've told this story many times, but I used to work in a hospital and one of the funniest things that just blew my mind one time was when they had me go do, uh, emergency work on their, they had a, a Liebert. Um, uh, no, it wasn't a Liebert. It was a climate master water source heat pump up in the attic. And, uh, it was for the server room. It was like a secondary one, but it's interesting when these hospitals, they have a primary and a secondary. If any one of those goes down, it's a nine one one emergency. It's not like, Oh yeah, you got time. No, they always have redundancy, which is a good thing. But, um, they called me out one time and I go over there and I'm checking the system out. Now, this is down in their basement, okay? So they have a, a, a open-loop water system, cooling tower, right? And they just add chemicals and different things to the water. But um, it's it's an evaporative cooler. So they do get mud and different things, different debris in the system through the cooling tower. So what happened was they fouled – well, they didn't. They plugged up the strainer on the water source heat pump so many times that – 
their service technician was getting sick and tired of having to come downstairs to the basement. So he decided that he would solve this problem. It was happening like every week they were plugging up the strainer. So his solution was to just shut off the water, take the strainer out, put the cap back on and turn it on. Fast forward three weeks later, they call me out and now I have a completely fouled condenser, uh, a coaxial condenser. And I have to clean a coaxial condenser, which are a nightmare to clean. And let's keep adding to it, right? If you're going to flush it out, put some rid lime in a pump. I had like a custom pump I made and everything. You put rid lime in that, whatever. This water source heat pump is for the server room, but it's over the UPS room. Like I'm literally standing over the UPS devices that power the entire hospital. That's the battery backup systems. So it's just like those things were such a nightmare. And then it's funny too, is as I'm doing that, they're telling me don't do what the installing contractor did. And I'm like, what's that? And yeah, he ruptured a water line on top of the, all the UPSs and uh, they lost them all. So anyways, it's like now they're giving me pressure and all this stuff and then come to find out that their solution for the strainers plugging up was just taking it out. It's just like it caused so much trouble and so much grief. But anyways, getting back to it, hospitals can be awesome. Facilities can be awesome, but then they can also be a pain when you have contractors or other service technicians because it just gets to be a headache. So um, I just thought that was a funny story. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jelly or Jello YouTube. Um, uh, for the super chat, bud. Uh, about to start supermarket HVACR and never worked HVAC. Any tips? Uh, any tips? Ooh, man, you're about to start supermarket and you've never even worked in the trade. Boy, whoo! Get ready, man. Get ready. It's gonna be busy. You're gonna be. Uh, you're gonna be moving your butt. Supermarkets. Uh, you're. You're good for you, man. Uh, hopefully you're young. Hopefully you can take some intense work because that's gonna get you. But supermarket dudes, they're a different breed. Um, those dudes are, uh, they're, they're super knowledgeable. You got to do what you got to do, get equipment running. So, um, uh, any tips, just keep your eyes and ears open, pay as much attention as possible and do research. When you get done with work, you don't know what it was. You don't know the new equipment you were working on, research it, you know? So when you go home, work's not over. That's when you start studying. Hopefully that helps for you, bud. Um, uh, all right. So let me cross those ones off my list right there covered those ones and let's look at the chat real quick hmm yeah chain of lakes refrigeration i just read your comment again i don't know man that's an interesting one it's cool to touch in the attic that's interesting um i'd start uh um Maybe doing digital temperature clamps uh, at the liquid line downstairs at the condensing unit and then get it at one end of the attic and then get it at the, the you know, the TXV and then see where the temperature changes. Uh, maybe maybe someone left a plug in or something and it just got released. I don't know. That's an interesting one. Um, I don't think it's a low charge thing, though. So uh, let's see. Question. 20 year old Lennox 10 ton package unit R134A hole. Um, lost charge in one week. Pressure tested at 350 today. Could not find any leaks. Got some wires wet and found the leak from the wired. Oh, 134A hole. Uh, dude, I have found that before. Did that not blow your mind? So he's basically saying that he couldn't find the leak and then he found it. It had an encapsulated pressure control and it was coming out the other end of the wires from the encapsulated pressure control. I have seen that. It is crazy when that happens. It blows your mind. Like take as many pictures and videos of that. If you ever do, it is the coolest. It, it, that is a really cool thing to see when you find that and you're like, dang, it's running through the jacket. The encapsulation is that good. So that's, that's crazy, man. Absolutely bonkers. I, I that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So um, uh, any favorite tools this past week that made my day easier? Matthew Lopez. Um, well, I've written, no, I wouldn't say this last week. Um, well, I mean, there's a couple new tools that I've been using. I, there's another one that I haven't shown you guys that I've been using a little bit, just kind of getting comfortable with it is I also got actually have the box right here, the NAVAC swaging tool, this thing right here. 
I had happened to have the little box, the the NTE11L. Um, I got that from True Tech Tools. I'd seen it at uh, AHR, and uh, I held it at AHR, and then I knew I wanted, so I pre-ordered it with True Tech Tools. Um, by the way, if you guys go to True Tech Tools and you purchase any tools there, use my offer code Big Picture. You'll get an eight percent discount, and I get a small commission from that. It helps to support the channel. So, anyways, but I bought that from True Tech Tools. I want to say it was like four or six hundred bucks somewhere. I can't remember somewhere in there, um, but it goes down to three eighths. I got to say, okay, first off, I appreciate the swaging tool, okay? And I, and I really would like to make a video on it, and I'll probably talk about this in the video too, but I do appreciate the swaging tool, and I appreciate it what it does because before that I was using the spin swage, and I just don't care for the spin swage. My drills are never fast enough. It's a pain in the butt, especially when you get into bigger stuff. So this swage, when I picked it up, it felt like I was holding an impact gun for diesel trucks. It was huge when I got it. I, I, I must have felt it at AHR, but I didn't realize it was so big. So I was very disappointed with the size of it. Uh, the next thing is like the half inch and the three eight swages. They're horrible. And you have to spin the swage tool uh, halfway through or it'll crack the pipe. So again, I appreciate this because this is the best battery powered swaging tool on the market right now. I think it's the only one, but I mean, it's, it's innovating and I'm, I'm still going to use it and I like it, but I feel like there's some, some stuff that needs to change with it. So I'll do a video. That was an interesting one. So I appreciate it and it's awesome. I've used it many times. It's just, uh, just a little disappointed in some of the, the functions that it has, but it's still going to serve a purpose. I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm going to continue to use it for years probably. Um, but the new ones that come out are going to be awesome. I'm sure because there's always, you're always going to try to be better. Right. So I'm sure Navac is already probably working on something new, you know? So, uh, we'll see. But, um, that's the one thing I kind of been getting working out with the last couple weeks. So, um, let's see, uh, Mike B have a drink and celebrate that leak find hard to find. That is absolutely right. Mike, um, bah, 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 bah. see what else I'm missing in here. Um, Jason Johnson says he likes the Hillmore swage. It's compact and it works great. I was just kind of worried about the carpal tunnel issues with the hand ratcheting. I mean, I guess I'm not doing it every single day. So is it really going to be that big of a deal? But yeah, I just went straight to the battery. I think I just got big tool eyes when I saw it and I was like, I got to have it. And then it's like, Oh, okay. You know, I'll still use it. Um, let's see. Samuel had asked me a question, uh, when he's working on static cold rails. So if you're working on, uh, some of the refrigerators for some of the restaurants, they have a, a, a well up in the top of the box and it's just a static, cold wrap right it's a wrap that goes around a pan so you just put pans in there no ice or anything like that and just off of natural convection it's going to bring the temperature so we call it static though because it doesn't have an evaporator fan motor um so his question is is when you're charging a system or checking the pressures when you have a static cold rail on the top with no fan motor and a normal dx you know evaporator coil down below with fan motors how do you charge that um, if your system doesn't have a sight glass, right, is the top supposed to be running or is it just the bottom running? Because oftentimes when you call manufacturers, they want you to charge the pressures. They don't tell you superheat, subcoin, anything like that. So really the answer is it depends on every piece of equipment. I work on Dell field units. Okay. Dell field doesn't publish pressures for the cold rails up, or at least they didn't used to. It's been about a year since I've called them and asked them, but they don't publish pressures when the top sections are running so their published pressures as where they should be are only with the bottom running so then you charge according to pressure that way oftentimes these manufacturers they beat to the tune of their own drum they don't follow standard refrigeration practices they install txv systems they have a receiver but they don't put a sight glass or they don't put a receiver or a sight glass or they put a receiver dryer good gosh if you guys have ever worked on a glass tender unit there, what looks to be like a dryer is a receiver dryer. It's huge. You can't just replace it with a normal dryer because then they're not going to have enough refrigerant in the system. So they beat to the tune of their own drums. They do things to save money. Always lean on the manufacturers. Okay. So each one does their own thing and it's always really weird. 
Uh, Todd Bayer, thank you very much for that super chat, man. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you said, uh, Todd Bear, I know you. Well, thanks, bud. I know you, right? Yeah. Um, anyways, have I ever used any products from Upanor? Uh, no, I hear my friends talking about the Upanor products. Um, I have friends that do a lot of the residential, high-end residential stuff, and I hear them talking about them, but I personally have never used those products. So, um, let's see what else. Uh, I'm reading through the chat right now. Um, Hillmore Hydraulic, not much pressure needed to swage. Right on. Okay, um... Let's see, jo uh, Javi, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce your name. You'd sent me a question asking me what my preference was with Field Piece or Testo. And in his email, he said he knows that I'm sponsored by Field Piece. I'm actually not sponsored by Field Piece, to be clear, okay? I do uh, kind of like piece work with Field Piece. When they want to work on a campaign or a project, then I work on a specific project. But I'm not under contract with them. They don't pay me monthly. They pay me whenever I do work for them, Okay. Um, but anyways, not, not that it matters. Okay. I think that majority of you that know my content and watch my videos on a regular know that I try to be as sincere as possible and I don't let anybody buy me out or influence my decisions. In fact, I, I mean, if you talk to some of my friends, I've turned down some pretty big offers because they didn't want me to be able to do things the way that I do them. Okay. Um, and, um, I just try to stay real because the moment that this becomes a job for me, I just have no interest in doing it anymore. So I like to have fun with it and do what I want to do. My ideal goal, this is where, um, you know, I'm going off on a tangent right now, but my ideal goal is that this channel still have HVACR content, right? And then I want this channel to have a tool like I already have a YouTube channel, the HVACR tools, but I haven't been posting on it lately. But I want to have a fully self funded HVAC tool review channel where um, basically I'd still have to do sponsorships and things, but I want to be able to buy every single one of my tools and be able to give genuine, honest responses about those tools unbiased. That's something that I want to do. It's I'm not there yet because I don't have the capital to be able to start just buying everything that I want to buy. Um, but I know it is possible, uh, ironically, because of a local radio show that I listen to that I've listened to for like 10 years. Um, it's uh, Leo Laporte and he's a tech guy and, but he, he self funds all of his own computer stuff. He doesn't take products anymore. And uh, he just uses sponsorships and different things. But um, I want to be able to do that. So that's something that I want to do in the future. As, sorry, I'm going off on a whole tangent there. But anyways, about Field Piece and Testo. So um, it really depends on what is, is available to you, okay? Each one is going to have an up and a down, okay? Testo, uh, especially with their manifolds, the ones made in Germany, they're... How they're 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 one of the best manufactured the German ones are from what I've heard the one of the best manufactured digital manifolds out there and they're very very functional um, and uh, a lot of their other tools too right uh, the Testo stuff has always been very very high quality um, but it's not always the same with the probes from what I hear I've had the Testo probes I think I gave them away um, to, uh, a viewer, actually a friend of mine. Anyways, um, I sent them all to him just because I don't like them. The field piece ones for what I do, they're what I like. I like their probes. I like their manifolds. They're local to me. They're in Anaheim, California. I have a great relationship with them. I know that they, uh, are, have great customer service. Anybody that lives in Southern California has probably in HVAC has either heard of someone or has been themselves to the field piece office. You take tools when they're damaged. They have a great, great warranty policy. I love field piece stuff and their probes just kill it with their range. And, um, whether you use the job link app, which they just updated and changed, uh, I'm not being paid for any of this either, by the way. I dig the new job link app for certain applications, and then I also use Measure Quick for certain applications. There's two things, not either the job link app or Measure Quick is perfect in my eyes, but both of them have features that make me still want to use both of them. Um, and I like them. So I, I'm personally partial to field piece, but it's not because I'm being paid to do so. So uh, let's cross that one off. Um, Troy had mentioned in uh, one of my videos that uh, 
when I did an exhaust fan video, he said that uh, the, I mentioned in the video that the filters were done. They needed to be thrown away. And he was saying, well, they can still be cleaned if they use the right cleaners and the right amount of temperature. And I agree. Um, I have one of my restaurants that actually that I do service work for. They have a giant well. It's a heated well that they drop their hood filters into every night. And it heats them up to like 200 degrees or something like that and just sits there and boils and crap off of them. So they just pull them out, rinse them off and call it a day. Uh, so yes, I know that those filters could have been saved, but understand something again, these videos are not scripted and they're not meant to be like, I don't film them. Like I'm talking to you. I film them like I'm talking to my employees and, um, knowing this customer they're never going to clean them right. If I tell them to clean them, they'll say they clean them and then I'll be back multiple times uh, versus. And what I learned was to start going to the higher ups at the corporate office and saying, dude, you got to figure this out because these guys are ruining stuff for them. So I look out for the corporation too by recommending things. And so what I'm saying is in the video, I was more or less saying, you know, to my employees, yeah, these aren't salvageable. The restaurant, I wasn't giving context really is what I'm saying. I know they could have been clean, but I know that this restaurant is not capable of cleaning them the way that they need to. So it's easier just to tell them to replace them because uh, the amount of money they're going to spend on my service calls are going to, it's going to be so much cheaper. Just buy some new filters and move on. So I don't sell the filters by the way, either. So I'm telling them that, you know, buy them. I don't care who you get them from. Just get the dang filters. So I'm not benefiting from it at all. I'm talking them out of, of work basically. Um, so let's see what we got going on here. I do that a lot. actually talk my customers out of work. Um, I'm a crazy nut like that. Uh, Oscar had asked me a great, uh, a great question. So he was asking me about an exhaust wheel and I'm going to, I'm just paraphrasing his question. He was asking how to measure an exhaust wheel. Um, so I'm going to kind of go broad with that. And let's talk about sizing an exhaust fan, okay? Um, all right. So with an exhaust fan, first off, in a perfect world, you have engineered drawings in front of you, you know how much the uh, the hood canopy was designed, how much air it was designed to pull through it. You can just basically look at that, go to the exhaust fan manufacturer, say, here's the power I have at the building, 2083 phase. This is how much air I need to move. What do I need to do? And they custom build an exhaust fan, okay? That's in a perfect world. That never happens when you're out in the field. When you're out in the field, the customer calls, you go out there, this exhaust fan's 10 years old it's beat up there's no data on it it's not running you don't know you don't have drawings anymore you don't have any of that stuff and you got to figure something out okay so here's how you do it this is kind of like the roundabout hack way to size exhaust fans when you don't have all the drawings and perfect world in front of you okay so the first thing you do you have a, a non-functioning exhaust fan you take down the voltage okay once you know the voltage just measure it or um just look at the panels. You'll find out 2083 phase is most common in my area. Okay. So, you know, you need a 208 volt three phase motor. Okay. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to measure the duct, the curbing coming up through the roof. Okay. Not the exhaust fan, but the outside diameter of the duct coming up through the roof. Okay. Measure the outside diameter. So, you know what the fan needs to fit over. Okay. Then what you do, you may need a curb adapter. That sometimes happens too. Once you get the measurement of the diameter of the curb, so that way you know what size fan to put over that, what you need to do is take the existing fan and measure the wheel, okay? You measure the height of the wheel, and you kind of got to guesstimate a little bit, and then you measure the diameter. And if you have the diameter and the height, they can match that wheel up to an exhaust fan with that same wheel size. So what the exhaust fan company will do is say you have this kind of power, you have this size breaker, so that gives them an idea where they need to backwards calculate some things. Then you know that the ductwork is this size, okay? Um, as far as, uh, you know, if they ask you how you want to design the static, it's pretty safe to say for most kitchen ducts that if you design at one inch of static, um, if you just say one inch of static, it's a pretty safe bet. Now, you can't make estimations in other situations, and understand this is kind of a redneck way of doing it, okay? Um, so once you have that information, uh, if you still want to backwards calculate further, take the motor RPMs, the wheel size, 
and uh, the pulley sizes and match all that up on the new fan. Make sure you get the same size pulleys. Then you can kind of guesstimate and roundabout come up with the same exhaust fan. So the new exhaust fan will be able to somehow fit over a curb. It'll have the wheel that's the same size as yours. Uh, you have the motor information, you know, so you're basically just backwards building a fan um, with what they have available, and that'll get you in the ballpark. And that's the easiest way to kind of come up with a new exhaust fan size. So I know I answered your question there, Oscar, but then I added a whole bunch more to that. So hopefully that makes sense to any of you guys and isn't just my rambling that nobody understands. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Um, uh, Jesse is saying thoughts on weighing in the charge via vapor on the low side with a cap tube system only. So the compressor doesn't start against a full head of liquid. Jesse, uh, don't sweat it, bro. You're, you're think about it. I mean, when you're charging a system, what you need to do, first off, don't sweat so much about the compressor starting up. Okay. So what you do when you say charges a vapor, it's safe. Just assume every refrigerant you use just charges a liquid, dude. Uh, it's just easier. I mean, you still got to be careful in certain situations. I get what you're saying, but also you need to remember there's not many refrigerants out there that you can charge in a vapor form anymore because most of them are all blends. And if it's a blend, you always have to charge it in a liquid form. Okay. So the only refrigerant that you are possibly even working on is R12 or R22. That's a, um, or 134A. Technically you can charge 134A as a, a vapor. Um, but just charge as a liquid, man. It's easier. Turn the system off, pull a good evacuation, put everything on there, let the scale run, let it suck in as much refrigerant, turn it off, turn the high side off, turn the system on, start it up and slowly meter it in through the low side. I think a lot of people get a little too paranoid about charging liquid on a compressor. Um, you really, really need to be careful about it on semi-hermetic compressors. Um, but scrolls and recips, at least the modern ones, they can handle a little bit of charging on the low side. I mean, you don't want hundred percent liquid going back to them, but give them a little bit. They'll be okay. So, um, let's see what else we got going on in here. Captive air is cool. Their HMI is nice. You're more of a rapid fan though. Um, I don't know who rapid F fan is. I do a little bit of work with captive air. I do a little bit of work with green heck. I've done work with cook, um, a couple different ones. I mean, uh, I'll be honest, my favorite exhaust fans out there are the utility set fans. So Captive Air, Green Heck, they all make them. But I like the utility fans because especially uh, there's a company that was out here in Southern California called Central Blower, and they're custom and local. And they just make utility fans. And the cool thing about utility fans is they're just easy. They have standard pillow block bearings. They have room to work, and they're just easier. They take up more space. They're a little bit more ugly when it comes to high rises and different things looking down on buildings but utility fans just seem to be the easiest to work on maybe that's just my old school i'm asking in the chat right now do you guys prefer like a mushroom style exhaust fan versus a utility style with a you know a donaldson or a supreme or something like that or a central blower i prefer the utility ones um i like full-size pillow block bearings i like to be able to get to a shaft and a wheel you know and not have to be like tucked down in a mushroom let's see what else we got going on here um uh how do i braise copper to brass matthew lopez when you're using dissimilar metals whether it be stainless to copper stainless to brass copper you know and vice versa all the way around um you need to use a high silver content solder so um, what I'm going to use is me personally, I use 56% silver solder. So that's a very high silver content. You need to use a paste flux that's made for silver soldering. Going to clean the heck out of the pipe, flux it, and get it nice and hot. The key to using silver solder, and this is the tricky thing, when you're using high content or high silver content solder, 56, 45%, whatever it is, you have to get it so unbelievably hot to get the solder to flow. But then once it flows, it flows like plumbing solder. It's really interesting how it works. Um, but you got to get it uh, like uncomfortably hot to get it to flow. And then boom, it just goes, you know, unlike Silphos where Silphos, you've got to kind of work with it a little bit when you're doing copper to copper, but silver solder, man, it's just whoosh wraps right around. It's really nice, but it's kind of tricky too. Um, so let's see what else we got going on in here. Jason's saying 46 in silver, stay silver, and then 56%. Yep. So 
Um, yeah, there is other rods. I see someone in here saying uh, Sean Hawk is saying an orange rod. So if you go to um, Harris, if you go to um, Solder Weld, they all have different uh, flux-coated rods that you can use. I personally don't like the flux-coated rod because my experience with flux-coated rods is they sit in my van for a long time and they rattle around and the, the flux dries out and it starts to chip away. And then when you go to solder, like big chunks of the flux fall off and it's just kind of annoying to me. I just prefer the roll, but I don't know. It's been a while since I've tried the flux coated rods, so maybe I'll try them again. Uh, it's just been a little bit. Let's see what else we got going on here. Looks like my phone was going off. Let's see if it's an emergency here. Who's trying to call me? Oh, okay, got it. And got service calls, too. Are they emergencies? They don't look like emergencies. All right. Let's see what else we got going on in the chat. Um, how do you braze aluminum? Uh, again, just a special solder, a very low temperature when you're brazing aluminum. If you're using an oxyacetylene torch for brazing aluminum, man, you got to have a small tip on that and turn that heat way down. Oftentimes, they'll actually recommend that you use like a propane torch um, a map gas torch or something like that when you're when you're soldering aluminum uh, but it's really just about cleaning it up getting the low temperature solder to flow making sure it's a clean surface and letting it cool slowly um, and then go to town i personally never had to solder an evaporator coil on aluminum i have done it just for fun um, just to try it out you know because i do have some just in the shop but have not had to use it yet at all so um, let's see what else we got going on here uh let me see. What brand boots do I wear? Jake. Um, well, currently right now, I'm retiring a pair of the Brunt work boots. Um, long story. Brunt work boots, sent us work boots. I probably still need to make a video about it, but it's just a whole HVAC overtime thing. We all got boots, and it was just a disaster. But I've been wearing mine for a year, but they're finally done. They are done, done. Um, so I'm kind of going back and forth. I personally have a pair of, uh, Irish setters. Those are like the cowboy boot slip on style ones. And I love those boots, but those are more for personal, like going out kind of stuff. Um, I live in like redneck side of California. So we're always going where there's dirt and different things like that. So I like having uh, work boot style cowboy boots. Um, but they're so comfortable, ridiculously comfortable now. So I'm contemplating going to check out something with that comfort level, maybe back at Red Wing or something. Um, but, uh, I don't know exactly where I'm going before that. I used the Timberland pro, uh, boondocks, I think is what I used for like probably five or six years. I used the Timberland pros. Um, so I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, when you ask people about work boots, boy, does everybody have an opinion? Um, so, all right, let's see what else we got going on inside here. Um, all right, well, uh, one last thing I want to cover real quick. Um, in a recent video, and this is an uh, exhaust fan video, I mentioned something in that I don't like there to be a slope in the seal tight conduit of the exhaust fan, okay? Um, and the reason why I said I didn't like a slope is because you'll get water puddling up and it's frustrating. Okay. Um, there's more to it than that. Again, it's one of those ramblings of my brain without explaining things to you. I understand the need for a drip leg. And the thought is, is that it's not going to make it way, it's way back down to the electrical panel and dump a bunch of water in the electrical panel. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, one of the problems you have with exhaust fans is oftentimes the exhaust fans are cleaned. They have a professional cleaning company that comes out. And when they do that, they use high pressure water. Oftentimes the high pressure water will get into the electrical boxes. It'll short out electrical switches and it'll get down into the conduits. It's not a good thing. What I've actually seen happen many times, which will blow your mind is the water went in through the fan into the conduit. And then when they hinged the fan back down, it went into the electrical box and shorted out the switch. And I had that happen multiple times. So I understand the need for that leg going down, um, you know, to keep water from going down. I'm saying more or less, I don't like it on the exhaust fan. So it's one of those things where I try to have a junction box or something like that to try to help. So that way, if water does get down into the, the junction box, it doesn't make it down to the conduit. Sometimes you can pipe them accordingly. But I prefer to not have that drip leg because of how many problems I've seen. So 
I know you got to be careful with different codes and different things like that. So, um, maybe try the Red Wing Boa laceless boot system. I, we'll see. I'll have to go check them out. So, all right, everybody. Um, Matthew Lopez, am I hiring? Um, at the exact moment, no, but in the future, yes. If you're interested in working with me, if you haven't already, send me a resume, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Um, and I'll look at it. I've got a lot of resumes of great looking people. It just, um, wasn't able to hire anybody as of yet. So, uh, let's see what else. Uh, what's my preferred parts house. Do they have United refrigeration around here? Just getting the hang of this, Sean. Um, yeah, my, uh, preferred refrigeration supply houses that I use here in Southern California. There's three of them, uh, refrigeration supplies, distributors, RSD. They're a West coast supply house. Um, uh, allied refrigeration. They're a West coast supply house. Also, um, they're a local company, uh, I like using them and United Refrigeration. So pretty much between those three refrigeration supply houses, and then you have your OEM train carrier, you know, the, the OEM manufacturers houses that you got to go to get their parts from. But, um, yeah, I, I do use United. Uh, I use them. I probably use RSD the most, um, just because of customer service. I think I pay more money at RSD for parts and different things like that, but I'm kind of willing to just because of the customer service. And, um, you know, I feel, I feel appreciated when I go into the supply houses at RSD. I don't know. It's weird, uh, but I guess, I don't know, whatever. I just, I just prefer those ones. United used to be my number one supply house. It just kind of customer service kind of started going down and, you know, I kind of moved on over to other places. So I still use United from now and then, um, nothing bad to say about them. Just, you know, customer service issues. That's all. Um, Let's see. Uh, Goodman air handler, 28 volts from transformer to board, only getting 14 volts out of the board, replacing board tomorrow. Am I going in the right direction? Found unit dead with blown air handler fuse. I mean, it doesn't sound like you're horribly far from the right direction. I mean, I'm sure there could be more information that would help me to understand, but quickly, it doesn't look like you're wrong. Something's going on there. Uh, make sure your transformers tapped, right? I'd say that. Um, yeah, but it doesn't seem like you're in the wrong direction. So, uh, I do appreciate you all. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and, uh, my something about the air right now in this heat, it's drying me out. I'm freaking my throat's all dry right now. Um, so I'm going to wrap this. Remember, I try to go live, uh, Friday evenings with the HVAC overtime show. I'm actually not going to be there this week. Um, I'm going to be going to a concert actually with my wife for my birthday. So, um, going to be uh taking friday off going to the festival we're going to see uh toby keith no not toby keith we're going to see um oh shoot who are we seeing uh blake shelton that's right we're going to see blake shelton and then there's two or three other dudes i can't remember that were on the ticket too so uh going to go to that concert it's going to be here local to me so going to do that friday so i won't be making it to the overtime show but definitely check out the show i'm sure they'll have uh something good going on and uh let me know if it burns down okay all right, let's see what else we got. I'm going to wrap this up, transition to my outro music. And uh, remember all, uh, be kind to one another. Um, never know what everybody else is going through. Give them a chance.
That dude's getting big, right? He's freaking huge. He's got to be like 70 pounds, man. Yeah, that guy is, uh, he's not anything but small. So, all right, I'm going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you, and uh, we will catch you all in the next one.